Hi, I'm Louise Vett. I'm director of the Netherlands Institute of Ecology, which is an academy institute, and we do research, ecological research. I'm also a professor of evolutionary ecology at Wageningen University. And um, not so long ago, actually we just moved in, we built a new building um, for two of the centers of our institute. I'm going to talk about that at the end of my talk. But first I would like to take you through a bit of inspiration to go to the circular economy. And I think something has gone wrong in our evolution. We really, uh, yeah, we, we stepped out of nature. And um, as an ecologist, uh, we can now very much see the results of that uh, because we're using our planets completely wrong. And a lot of people don't see that in their normal, let's say, life perhaps, but on a global scale, we see that a lot. We see destruction of our ecosystems that deliver us beautiful uh, services and, and our biodiversity for food and for energy and for resources. We destroy these ecosystems and it's uh, not going to work that way. Now, a lot of people think that energy is the problem. I don't think energy is the problem. We have the sun and solar energy is very important. We could use it a lot more. I think what is a problem is our linear economy the way we do it now. We have a take-make-waste economy where we just make things and at the end we destroy it, which is a really stupid business deal to start off with. So stuff is running out and uh, our resources are, uh, are being finished. And, you know, think about it. Um, with the way we use, for example, an important material like copper, um, the way we use it now, we have about 39 years left before it is used up. So we need alternatives and we need a different way of dealing with it. Now one crisis, if you can call it a crisis, um, that people don't know much about, something that is running, up, uh, running out, is phosphorus. Phosphorus is a crucial element. It's in our DNA in every living organism. And we mine it from phosphate ore. And the uh, calculations are that we have between whatever, 80 or 200 years left, but we're running out and we cannot really replace that one way or another. So if we look at the production and the mining of, um, of phosphates, it's going down, but the prices are going up tremendously from, from let's say, $21 uh, dollars a ton in, in 1993 to, to, let's say, over uh, 100 in 2008 in this case. So that is really becoming a good business deal to do, to do something else with our phosphates. So, I can say this, that this is a problem, but that would kill most people because they don't like problems. Why not say that it, it's a challenge? And it's a challenge for the younger generation to do it differently. And that creates enthusiasm and people want to join in. So crisis really asks for innovation. And well, I, I, and I think innovation, this whole planet has served us, or rather this whole planet has worked well for three and a half billion years and so we, there's a lot of things we can learn from this planet and um, I want to show you, I want to talk about three basic lessons from ecology. Of course the first lesson is that in nature there is no waste because all materials are food for something else and processes and species are connected in, in food webs. There is no waste in nature. So why not replace our technical production systems with that where waste is food and we keep things in a technical cycle instead of the biological cycle. So that's an important lesson. And it brings us to the heart of a circular economy. And we, we also talk about processes in this case. And I'll show you uh, the cradle to cradle design is, is, is in your brain, but that it deals with products. So another lesson from ecology is that energy comes from the sun. And I go straight to the third lesson. And that is that in nature, the diversity is crucial. So there is adaptation in nature through diversity. It's not a one solution fits all in nature. And we left that. Think of our monocultures. Think of our dominant uh, businesses in, in, in industry. So we have to go back to local and to diversity energy production as a local and a diverse um, production system. 
where we can also connect up uh, a diversity of um, uh, energy producing systems or CO2 producing systems, actually connect up industry as an ecosystem. It's very much a system thinking. And of course, as a scientist, I say there is a lot of possibilities in using biological system, like for example, cyanobacteria that can produce um, in a certain way our fuel from CO2 minerals and solar. And for scientists, there is a lot of uh, inspiration uh, to be done for the next future. The life sciences are going to be the next big wave of entrepreneurial activity. The life sciences where we use nature, we explore nature, we exploit nature in a sustainable way. And it's a big challenge for scientists and business. So I'll bring you to our new building in Wageningen from uh, where uh, we said that the whole cradle to cradle design is going to be leading in what we want to do. So our ecological research that we do there, we use that as a basis, our thinking in systems and in, in cycles. We want to go to an uh, eco-effective construction in a cradle-to-cradle -cradle way and stimulate eco-technology as an ambition. So NEO goes circular. And we've done that with materials, with water and nutrient cycles, and with our heat and our cold. And uh, Klaus and Kahn architects really had the challenge uh, with a whole group of experts to design something else. And of course the materials is where it starts, materials that are good for man and for environment. The building is really can be taken apart and materials can be used again. Steel, glass, uh, wood, local wood that is made completely sustainable by a sort of a cooking and high pressure method. We have a very novel uh, energy system where we use thermal panels, solar panels, to store heat 300 meters below ground. And so we can use summer for winter. And in the winter, we have the cooling towers that make a seven degree source and we can use it to actually uh, uh, cool our buildings in the summer. We didn't really want to um, deal with the present day uh, innovations are much more interesting. So we have deals with the universities to use a new generation of solar cells that we use. We have several ways of using solar energy uh, to produce our electricity and our heat. We also look at the way plants can actually produce electricity. So plant microbial fuel cells and 25 meters, square meters on our roof. We have plants that can produce electricity. That would, I have to tell you a lot more about that. I won't. You can look at a small company called Plant E uh, that, is, that is doing this type of research. It's a very interesting way of producing uh, electricity. And of course, we close nutrients and water cycles. So if you go to the toilet uh, in our building, uh, something good is being done with that. We want to recover the, in the important phosphates. Uh, but first, our sludge goes to a fermenter where we produce gas. And uh, all the nutrients are being fed to algae. And of course, we can use the algae again after we harvest them for all kinds of things, but also to create new possibilities, to bring it back to the soil that really needs it. And we do research on how algae can also uh, treat our water to get our water clean. Because in our feces, you find uh, pharmaceutical rest products, medicines, uh, the pill, uh, hormones, E. coli bacteria. And so we want to study how algae can actually help to, uh, to make the water clean. So we can actually locally, without a sewage system, um, get rid of our water and it turns into groundwater again. We have a big green experimental roof where we look at different vegetations and together with a whole consortium of hydrologists and biologists and technical people and roof people that make roofs, uh, we do research on what type of biodiversity we can create on that building how water and air filtration occurs, how the hydrology is of the incoming water and the outgoing water, and how it cools and isolates the building. 
all through the area, and not only on the roofs. We stimulate biodiversity where we restore and plant hedges, where we make, create natural fences, create microclimates. We have a bed cellar, and our bicycle shed is turned into a bee hotel. So nature is there for inspiration, where we have uh, used the concept of waste is food to close the cycle, where we use solar income and where we have great respect for biodiversity. And one lesson we learned from that is that we have to share knowledge, resources and competences to innovate together. Because as a scientist you can't do it by yourself. There is a big challenge, but you need industry as well. You need the government, you need the public, you need the media to, to get a success. And overall, I think we need to pilot because without pilots, there is no innovation. And of course, there is no innovation without risk. And somebody has to take the risk. I think it's a great new challenge to society. Society that first, let's say, human society discovered the fire that we could do wonderful things with. About 10,000 years ago, we discovered agriculture. And... Uh, we could build a society and didn't have to run after our food anymore. Then we got industrialization in, in, in the 19th century where we actually had a lot of benefit, but also a lot of negative side effects that didn't matter so much because there weren't yet 9, 10 billion people on this planet. And right now we are entering, we think, through a transition, uh, a new social ecological regime where we, where we can actually take a responsibility for the planet and we think in cycles and we look at us as a part of nature rather than being outside nature that's as something that was given to us to do whatever we want with. So we are part of nature again and um, I, I, I have trust that we, we can start doing that and I hope that I showed you that with our building we, uh, we took the chance and the challenge to, uh, to do it differently. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.